Okay, gentlemen, morning, good afternoon, wherever you are. How are we all doing? Uh, great. On the move. Good, great. <laughs> Mark, I, had, uh, um, I, I can't help but notice that you, uh, you're on the move. You're a mobile mm -hmm. podcaster today. Looking very tanned, by uh, the way. Oh, thank you. Lovely sunny day here in Stockholm. Um, yeah, we're, I've been up early. We've had a long day. We've had a kind of big, really good camp with 175 of our kids. And then um, spread over two football pitches, kids 8 to 12. And then we've had some final meetings with, with, in the club about all the development, heads of development and etc. cetera right. today. So, yeah, so I'm just finished that meeting now and just Heading stepping, outside, stepping outside into the pod. Uh, and, 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 and taking a detour to the pub. Yeah, well, it, it could end up that way. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, Britain, how are you, mate? Uh, we're doing well. Just wrapped up tryouts in the, uh, the old pay-to-play pay -play model. Yeah, like, yeah. How was your week off? What's that? How was the week off? What week off? <laughs> well, the week off from the pod. <laughs> Oh, oh, I got you. Um, yeah, it was it was filled with uh, lots of lots of discussions with parents, and you know what's in the best interest of their child. And I just said, you know, you want to win a trophy now because you don't know when it's going to come up again. <laughs> and they don't know how to measure success exactly. Um, <laughs> Petro. I'm sorry if I didn't say it right. That's as good as it's going to get. Welcome. Um, how are you? Thank you. I'm fine. Um, I think it's good enough for this occasion. Yeah. The pronunciation. Good, good, good. Um, so you, you come from Floorball. Uh, do you want to give a little yeah. uh, introduction to the listeners? Because I'm sure many people don't even know what Floorball is. Um, and I'm not going to lie, I don't uh, know much about it either. So we'll, we'll start with that before we get into some of the, the, the conversation today. Well, put simply, it's like uh, hockey without skates. But okay. you play with uh, you play with ball and a little bit smaller rink, but you have five plus goalie against five plus goalie. So pretty typical invasion sport. So so that's floorball and it's quite uh, popular here in Finland and in uh, Sweden, also Switzerland, Czech Republic. Those are the top four teams at the moment, uh, the top four nations at the moment. So it's a growing sport and and especially in Finland and Sweden is quite big. Right, right. So, uh, would you say? Um, I'm just curious because I, I, you know, I'm not a big hockey uh, fan, but would there be a lot of uh, players that transfer from floorball to hockey? I mean, I know that the Scandinavians um, are deemed as being, you know, some of the most skillful players right now. Whereas, you know, Canada and North America, it seems to be quite a physical approach to the sport. Is that is there a crossover between the two sports? Well, uh, when I played myself, uh, like 20 years ago, when I was a junior. It was uh, a bit like a sport for failed hockey players. So if you if you didn't didn't do quite well in the hockey, then you could transfer to floorball and maybe you could be a star there. But now I think uh, it's starting to be a little bit separate because you have the like the season is at the same time, so it's it's not easy to combine the two two sports. So now it's more I think more like you might play floorball in, in the in the winter and and football in the summer. Right, soccer. right. Yeah, I, I, what, I needed uh, one of those sports for soccer. You know, when you're not very good at soccer, I could fall into. What would that be, Mark or Britain? Um, lacrosse. Lacrosse. Okay, there we go. There we go. Mark, no, just so you know, is, mate. Lacrosse is big, but we have a we have this joke when people are, oh, my son or daughter plays lacrosse, and I'm like, so they didn't make the soccer team. Oh, <laughs> that's, that's harsh. That's harsh. Mark, if you, uh, if you do start talking, I have muted you purely down to the fact that your microphone keeps rattling on your coat, but you are clear when you talk, by the way. So we're, we're all good there. Um, so if you want to unmute, I think I can do it or you can do it on your screen. Um, Pertra, before we get into uh, some of the, the conversation, um, you know, what, what, where are you currently working? What, are you, what is your role? What do you do? Um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, currently, I'm working in this club called TPS, which is uh, one of the maybe the biggest clubs in floorball in Finland. We we have also hockey in TPS and football, so it's uh, like a 
it's like a big club, but we we more or less work separately. We have some some cooperation between the sports, but uh, pretty much we are we are like uh, uh, independent parts. And uh, at the moment, yeah, I, uh, I work uh, in TPS as uh, like uh, head of coaching development. I think that's the correct title. And at the same time, now I'm working in Swedish national team as a coach. So that's that's maybe atypical for a Finnish coach to be working with the Swedes. But now now I'm there, and it's been great fun. So so yeah, and. Uh, the background why I'm I think I'm here is uh, that I'm also now working with Finnish Floorball Federation kind of a workshop or working group so that that is why I have this question in my mind mm -hmm. so do you want to lead us into that then because um, yeah I know that this is one that's come up um, you know maybe worded differently but I think we've been on the the, the subject quite a few times um, yeah, feel free. And as I said, uh, and as we usually have a disclaimer, we don't really have any answers anyway, but we'd love to chat yeah. about things and explore it further. Yeah. Well, uh, the back, short background is, like I said, I work in this uh, like a working group uh, workshop with a few, few Finnish floorball people. Uh, then we try to rethink the junior system from, let's say, under 21s to under 14s. And at the moment we play in those age groups, we play a nationwide like, sort of league. And uh, now we are thinking that like critically. Uh, those of you who don't know, Finland is uh, pretty much the same kind of country than Sweden. It's long and like the people live in different parts of, of, the, of the country. And uh, so if you want to play a nationwide league, you're going to have long distance, distance uh, trips, uh, away games. And it's uh, one thing we are now um, like uh, trying to rethink, is there another way to do this? And the question for me at the moment is that uh, very often when we have this discussion, why do we have even this like a nationwide league? The, like the explanation is that we need those tough games. Uh, right. to, for for our juniors to develop optimally, and uh, it's always uh, we throw that around and we take it uh, like as uh, as a fact and take it for granted. And we pretty often, I, I think I've used it myself that we say that for junior, fifty percent of the games should be like even, and maybe twenty five should be a little bit tougher against a tougher opponent and. 25% against uh, like a weaker opponent, then then it would be optimal. But you never really get that. But mm. that's like the, I think the main thing behind that uh, we are playing at the moment on um, these nationwide leagues, and uh, it creates some problems. First of all, it it is expensive to travel. We might have like for our under 14 team might have. Uh, 500 kilometers, 600 kilometers. I don't know how much, how, how much is it in miles, three to 400 miles or so for to play one game and then you come back, then you get that tough game. Yeah, mm. but, uh, but I think the biggest beneficiary there is the bus, bus uh, operator, so to speak, so that gets, uh, gets the money from the trip. So, um, yeah, that's something we try to rethink now. So, it, and the question in my mind is that, is it really that we need, and how much do we need those tough games to like motivate our juniors and, and help them develop? I know you, if, if the, all, all the games were like 15 to two or, uh, or uh, 10, then zero or something like that, that's not very motivating, but, uh, I think there can be some some middle ground there. Mm -hmm. So that is yeah. that is what I'm thinking now. Is, uh, is is that so that you will get the best results by playing those a lot of those tough games against the biggest clubs? Or or I know there there will be. Some, it's a complex question because when you get uh, when the sport gets a little bit more expensive, 
then not everyone can anymore play and participate. Right. Yeah. So I've, I've got a couple of a couple of questions. You know, one, um, <clears throat> you know, the 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 issues of the challenges created with, um, you know, the national league. You know, the first part, I guess, would be you mentioned that it would it would be ideal for you know twenty five percent of the games to be really challenging and twenty five percent of the games to be, you know, a little bit easier. What is uh, what is kind of the thought process there? Like, why is that uh, ideal for you guys? Yeah, I think uh, if I can uh, answer, I think the idea is that there would be like, yeah, 25% of the games that you are playing outside your comfort zone, like uh, competing against better opponents. And then, then when you are a little, uh, when you are a better team, then you have this, uh, then it's your time to shine, so to speak. Then you can be a star, star sometimes, and mm -hmm. get those uh, good results sometimes. So I Britain. think that's the, that's like the myth behind. Right, right, Britain, and I, and I don't know. This could be a myth as well. And, and Mark, you may know a bit more, but I'm pretty sure I read that Tottenham in their academy, they, they did a third system where you'd be a third where you'd play in your age to try and get that optimal competition. A third where you'd play up an age so that you're at the bottom, uh, of usually the, the, you know, socially, et cetera, you'd, you've got many, many more challenges. And then you, you play a third when you're actually uh, older and you're having to lead and set examples. So I, I know, I've heard of similar model. Again, I don't know if that's accurate, what I read. Um, so again, it could be, again, leading to a myth. Um, but yeah, I don't know if there's something there. I don't know, Mark, if you heard anything similar to, to this and... Um, Again, you may be on mute. I did have to mute you again. I know you're good. Good. Yep. Anything from you? Yeah. Um, kind of. I think there's some bigger questions we need to ask about with regard to this discussion. And my first question would be, what are you measuring? Right. And then how are you measuring it? And who are you measuring? So and I think... Uh, yeah, I think you really, if you're starting to do ability groupings and talking about best with the best in, in when children or young players are still in this learning, learning in development, we can call it, learning in, uh, to play floorball, to play football, basketball, in development, in psycho, psychological, sociological, physiological, cultural development. So... How, what are you measuring and how are you measuring it and who are, who are you measuring and actually even why are you doing this so that, was, that would be my first question I think what's the measure what is it, what do you use yeah, I, I think there's <clears throat> everybody wants to improve the level of their sport and we, we feel like we, we improve the level of our sport through uh, improving the level of our teams and, mm -hmm. you know, putting more skillful players uh, all on one team, assuming that, you know, that we're developing those players and developing their sport. Um, I, I, if we were talking about improving a player's ability to interact with the environment skillfully, I think mm -hmm. that that variability in that environment uh, does provide a lot. Uh, as far as the, the challenge point, I think the challenge point leading to growth, uh, maybe some of the, the perception of belief being improved as a result of, of being successful, and, you know, and playing, uh, you know, in an environment where, that affords you a little more opportunity or affords you more time. Mm -hmm. um, but it, yeah, it's a, it's a very good question. Is, uh, we use, we use, this as kind of a tool and a framework for individual players. Um, mm -hmm. Many of the kids in our environment, they want to make their school teams. And the style of play in school is it's, uh, it's very direct. Um, it's very physical. And it's, you know, just 100 miles an hour all the time. And kids, kids have a hard time learning how to interact with that environment if they've never had the opportunity to play in that environment. So we, we do try to move kids up in age groups to help them get, you know, have the opportunity to become attuned to that environment and to interact with it when everybody's bigger, faster, and stronger as a part of their development. But it's, it's more to move them towards their goals of making their high school team. 
which is you know heavily influenced by culture but i would i would argue also that the, this is this is the individual's goal mm-hmm. Petra, so it's I like because uh, score them up. Sorry, sorry, yeah, because you know, I was doing some good research here done in Sweden about national team and district team selections of players at 15, and basically the result of the research was by, and this is like Swedish uh, football association coaches, and the the result from the research was that whatever felt right in the stomach. <laughs> which was what they were picking on because it right. felt right. So again, it, we're still back to, you know, do you, you know, yeah, it might be good to have a kid who wants to play in their school team, but why are you making that kid conform to a culture, a form of life, an expectation? Why, why can't a kid go in there and just dominate a midfield by not having to be the fastest, the strongest and everything? Why do you have to, why can't he be center back, but not be, two meters tall you know why why do we have these such fixed ways ways of um i mean it's a very narrow lens to look through it if, if and i know i guess it is a maybe uh, i've seen actually a, a school foot, uh, game over there britain when i was over with you mm-hmm. and it is very direct and it is very much the you know the biggest fastest strongest but also it's not very good football in many ways either it's more no, athletics no. Yeah, exactly. So why, 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 why are we conforming to this? Why, why are we just, you know, may, maybe as coaches we should be like trying to make her think the children, well, maybe we can do this another way. Mm. Absolutely. So it's, it's less of uh, having them conform to the bigger, faster, stronger direct mm. model. And it's more providing them an environment to which mm. the players have some of those characteristics to help them become attuned so they become a contributor okay. among yeah. among that those environmental constraints. Mm. Yeah, of course, of course. Yeah. That's, that's I mean, good. I, I know that um Yorgu we had on the, the show um way back, he I think around maybe a couple of days ago, he he posted something from Professor and I don't want to again, is it Dr. Arne Gull? How do you say Gull? Gullich. Gullich. Dr. Arne yeah. Gullich. Yeah, and again, it's around the same subject um, that there is no correlation. And initially, it's around 10-year-olds, but the same is true from uh, you know, 11 to 14, even 15 to 18. There's zero correlation with them basically being long-term senior players and having success at that level. Um, so again, I think it's still something that's relatively uh, new that we're all trying to explore further i think as you mm. say we, we don't we don't have the answers but i, I want to kind of and first feel free to jump in at any point if you have any mm-hmm. questions but um i kind of want to like understand a bit more about your specific situation because it seems that it needs to obviously be investigated further mm. why uh, is there not enough teams and therefore not enough competition in order to have to travel that distance and you know, uh, that's the first question. The second question is, I can relate to this. We're talking about this a lot right now. Travel fatigue, we're calling it. The kids are spending more time in a vehicle than they're actually playing on the, the, the actual game itself. Um, so, you know, there's, um, you know, expectations that they play multiple games in a day just to make it worthwhile. Um, you know, and again, are you getting the, is, is that in the best interest of the, of the players, the families, et cetera? So we're, we're something, particularly with COVID coming back, um, is this something that we want to do to our children? Um, but I guess that's the question. Why the need um, at this age to go across the nation? Well, that's a good question. I think, uh, uh, first of all, it's, uh, it depends a little bit in which part of Finland you are living and which part of Finland you have the club. I'd say if you are uh, northern, if you live in northern Finland, uh, there you won't have so many teams, uh, so many. Even if you are playing like uh, the closest rival, it can be 200 kilometers or something like that. Uh, But if you are living near Helsinki, the capital, or southern Finland uh, overall, then, then yeah, there are enough teams. One can always say that there should be, there still isn't like, uh, they are not good enough for mm-hmm. our team. But that's again, it's because it's a complex question because we create this kind of system that uh, when you are under 14, 
junior team and when you start to play like a nationwide league for Finnish championship then you will uh, more or less unintentionally also uh, create a situation where the smaller clubs in even those uh, places where are where more clubs clubs uh, where, where there's more clubs then the players from the small clubs will move to the big club mm. and you will lose the competition you would have there because they are moving mm. there because we are playing nationwide league. So it's kind of creating its own problems at the same time. So, so I think it sounds like a I level of, inc- it sounds like, cause I know I can relate to this completely. We have the same issue here in Nova Scotia. We have um, a, a community that's similar about 450 kilometers away. Um, and their nearest competition would be around 200 kilometers away. But it's around this notion of inclusion of that community um, in order to, for them to, to those individuals in that community to fulfill whatever development that they're going through. They just don't have access in order to, uh, you know, just play. It's not, it's not even it just, there's not enough people in that community. So I, I totally yeah. understand that. Um yeah, is there any, uh, what are some of the conversations, I guess, locally around trying to overcome that? And I mean, um, Britain, you may have the same problem in Utah. We certainly, it's, I think North America would be, a, this would be quite common. Yeah, um, I would say that there have been good discussions in this group. First of all, I, I, I raised my hat to Finnish Floorball Federation that we are having this discussion. I think Sweden, which is the, it's uh, Finland and Sweden are the top two top two countries, and the Sweden you are playing more locally when you're juniors, and uh, it's mm-hmm. keeping the sport a little bit cheaper. And you, in Sweden, you have more players at the moment. Uh, Finland has been like the number one in in uh, in men's world championships, and and I think I don't know if there's conversations in Sweden if they should do something something similar than Finland, but I I, I don't know I don't. I don't have anything to say about that, but I, I appreciate the conversations we are having in the Finnish Floorball Federation. People are realizing the problem and uh, mm. we are trying to rethink the system, but uh, yeah, there are some strong assumptions that are still like strong myths that, that we but, tell each but other. It, but isn't there a risk that if you are doing this best with the best, even best players, the best players playing against the best teams. A bit early, you're just judging on performance and not learning. Mm. You know, because yeah, exactly. You know that like performance is temporary. You know, it's just mm. it fluctuates at short term, whereas learning is relatively more per a relatively more permanent change over time. So mm. again, that's kind of back to my question: What are you measuring? You know, so it's a good question. It's and it's, good question. it's to navigate the challenge. You know, so are you mm. measuring learning or performance? Because performance is a very poor indicator of learning, in particularly in in young young people. Mm. Well, and I, also I, I must ask this: that uh, Finland tries to. We have this long term strategy in Finnish football federation mm-hmm. that we tried. Uh, try to be the like the biggest indoor sport in Finland in 2028. I think we are number mm. two or three at the moment. And uh, and uh, for me, I think at the moment we are we are trying to na- narrow the pyramid, so to speak, a bit too mm. early now. So so if we want if we want to be the biggest, this is not the way to do it at the moment. And and yeah. We are the leading nation, so I think why do we do this at the moment? Is it is this the time to make it even narrower, or should we still concentrate on growing the growing the, like the basic? Like yeah, it's kind of a catch do You want to grow the sport, but you're narrowing it mm. as well. Yeah. So it's, like the standard this standard model of talent development mm. pyramid model that is imposed very young. I mean, how is your participation rates? At the moment, uh, what do you mean? Uh, like, how, I, 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 how 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 was uh, have you like if you compare with ten years ago or five years ago with young people playing floorball? Yeah, it's clubs, still cool. It's uh, it's like uh, 
it's still growing a little bit. I think last season was the first season for a long time that it dropped a little bit. So mm. at least we are now creating, uh, we are not creating growth at the moment, at least, so to speak. So. Yeah, but you know, the, one of, one of, the, one of, the, one of the, a feature of complex systems is delayed feedback. Mm. Yeah, so yeah. the feedback from That's this right. probably won't come for a few years. Yeah. That Which is these are interesting, you know, because it's yeah. I have to say that that is so prevalent. Um, you know, kind of facing these kind of governing bodies and that sort of thing. Um, you know, U.S. soccer is uh, they want to become the preeminent sport in the United States. Um, but uh, the way that we think about things and the way that we design things again is to mm. try to discover. We're trying to discover, you know, who are going to be, you know, the top 18 or the top 22 for the national team. Mm -hmm. And we go about <laughs> trying to discover who is going to be, uh, you know, one of the lucky 500 players that makes it into the MLS and uh, who are going to be the next, uh, you know, two players to make it into one of the big leagues in Europe. And mm -hmm. I, I think that... I, I, I'd, I had heard about this many years ago. Um, they called it the bias bias. And the bias bias basically states that to even understand our biases is not to overcome them. And uh, I think there's, there's kind of a human, there's kind of a human bias to, you know, see, see a skillful player um, and think about all of the possibilities that we can imagine with what if we put all of these skillful players together, just imagine what you would have. Mm -hmm. But then again, we cause this problem where there's a lot of, there's a lot of inefficiency in the system of travel yeah. and money. And uh, I, I think we're not sensitive to the fact that uh, the, the, the player is not, you know, the supreme talent is, being defined by, you know, top 0.001% in the world, but they might be an early mature. But uh, I mean, what we're trying to do is affect challenge. I think we look at, you know, we want them to be challenged. Well, are we affecting the challenge point by putting them on the field with the best players? Have yeah, we, and there's, there's other really problems with that? this. There's other yeah. problems with this, Britain, as well. You're you, you know, this motivational, long-term motivational questions because you're, act, you're actually these players are possibly defining themselves as being the best with the best. Absolutely. Not the, not I, I, best, and that's the best performers, but it's not necessarily the best learners. Or the best. There, there's a certain right. badge they're wearing that defines them. And that, that's kind of a, a ticking time bomb for many young, young oh, people as well. It, yeah, it so is. And um, mm. so I have, I have uh, the 2010 boys for the state of Utah, the Olympic development program or the state select program. And it's, and it's where, you know, kids try out and, um, you know, they want additional training. These are our more ambitious kids. And we're pretty inclusive at the lower ages. Mm. But when you tell parents that there's no such thing as an elite 10-year-old, it's like you've taken all of the wind out of their sails. I was going to say that. I was going to, I was going to say this. <laughs> I mean, when, this is such a complex – because the parents as well, it, 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 they're trying to socially – um, through their kids, particularly in North America, and you probably get this, Britain, be able to rank themselves based on the, the kid's performance. So mm -hmm. like my family is like in the top five because my child's the top five performer. Again, it comes down to Mark's point. We simply do not know how to measure participation and the experience of sport. And it's that crystal clear. The parents, particularly in soccer in North America, because it's still a very, very developing sport, even though it's, it's massively played, they don't know how to measure that experience outside of the win and loss column. And we see it all the time here. The amount mm. of times where we see mass migration of players leave one club to go to another club just so that they can manufacture that, that they are the best performers in one team so that they can crush everyone around them. And what usually happens is they qualify for a national event after doing that and they get hammered because they've not had any competition. They've had no, no ability to be resilient because they've all been on the same team. And it's funny, it's, it's, it happens time and time again, and we just keep going around this vicious system cycle. Yeah. Because again, we're not willing to really stop and go, how do we measure this effectively? Yeah, and you don't, it, it changes the narrative. Um, mm. So kids don't play because they enjoy the game. 
because they enjoy the competition. They, there's, there's a, there's a narrative surrounding, you know, this, uh, this elite development and it's, uh, one of our podcasts, I don't remember which episode, but we're talking about we're, we're activating a career. Right. Yeah. But I, I mean, the cultural, the, the cultural influence is so strong. And you say, you know, we think about all of the podcasts yeah. that we're talking about and, and the level of thinking among the people that have been here. And it's heavily, heavily nuanced. Mm. And thus the, the pitch, the pitch of, Hey, what if we let players enjoy the game? Let it, let, you know, what if we let them develop uh, or that development emerged as a result of all of these really joyful interactions they're like turned off by the idea. Well, let, let me, let me give you this example and I'd love to get your opinion. I hope some of the parents of the club I'm at are listening to this. Um, <laughs> I'm getting, I'm trying to build a socially distanced program right now. So, you know, in Canada, the restrictions are very high. They can't, they have to meet social distancing rules. And I, I've already had parents call me and basically threaten to leave the club because we aren't going to do team specific sessions. Rather, we're just going to do age range because of the way that it's social distance. And I keep trying to explain, they can't even interact with each other. They can't even, there's no game. They're literally training in a space, but this, this culture, this, this means to have, no, I need my kids with the best kids. And I don't want to have my kids be associated with those kids that I deem as not being very good right now. It is madness. It's utter madness. Um, yeah, I mean, that, that, and this is socially distanced programs. I mean, you're talking about interacting Britain within the normal confines of how we play the sport. We can't even interact, and they still want to be divided and separated into levels. So, yeah, I think our, our structures, um, our structures have emerged as a result of our thinking as a society. We've, we've built them. And yep. in some cases where, you know, where we're failing is, um, it, it's kind of exactly what we deserve because we built it. But, uh, yep. I don't know, Go, going back to, going back to the national teams and, and that sort of thing. Um, if, if we're hoping to develop the sport and we're hoping to get people excited and engaged in playing, um, I think there's, there's naturally just a lot of draw to this kind of elite uh, this idea of, of travel and that sort of thing. And that's, uh, I think, perpetuated by you know, professional systems. From who, though, adults. From who? Because I think with now, I think it's key. If you ask the kids, that's one thing they don't miss. They actually don't miss sitting in the car and in the bus for hours yeah. and hours and hours. Yeah. Um, they, they just want to get back and play. Um, mm -hmm. They just want to be with their friends, you know, like at the, at the younger ages particularly. Um, I, I would question that they don't want to travel. I think that's a question we need to ask then. Um, I think that I see some kids not loving the car, but the idea of being on a travel team comes with some prestige mm -hmm. that, it's, that it's very yeah, attractive. Yeah, it, def it defines them. It's their badge they wear. And as I said, that's, yeah. just, a tick that's just a ticking time bomb, psychological yeah, yeah. ticking time bomb. Yep. But is I it, think, is I it think avoidable? I'd like to... Yeah, I mean, yeah. <laughs> Of course. I mean, if, 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 if you've just got a system, if you just built a system that celebrates itself, then that's really, really hard. You know, that's where we go back to this thing about if you if you're really are looking to um, reconceptualize youth sport, you've got to start with investigating your own environment, your own culture, your own form of life. So you've got to start there first. So you've got to understand that. But I think, like, with Perthu's Perth um, question, it's, I mean... Finland. I'm I'm living in Stockholm, so it's just across the water, you know. So uh, it, it is very a very culturally defined decision, probably of talent development, but maybe also something that hasn't looked. Maybe they. I'm just wondering how much. How have you investigated your own culture, your own environment, your own way of living in in these different communities? Because as you know, Perthu, like you know. Communities that live in Stockholm are not the same as the communities that live up way up in the north yeah. of Sweden and Yukmuk and places like that, you know. So it's almost like different cultures. So, what have you been doing to investigate these cultures, how they're thinking, how their sport culture is, what they think, what they need, what their needs are, what facilities they have, you know? Do, you know, what have you been doing? The answer is uh, pretty simple not enough. But one good thing, again, uh, 
uh, raise your hat for Finnish Federation now, we are going to ask the players, the players who are playing the actual game, why they are playing and what do they think about the traveling and and have they been tired? Have they have they seen their school uh, deteriorating? And uh, then we will ask the parents also that uh, how they see the situation, also the coaches mm-hmm. and like the team leaders. So we're going to have. Uh, at least a good try with this. So the, will will my, you be taking uh, the soci- socioeconomic uh, factors of individuals into this? These these uh, questions. Well, there's not because, that kind of I question. Think they, I think yet. they'll influence. Yeah. I think they could influence the answers. Yeah, that's true. And and at the moment, it's it is at uh, like the eastern part of Finland. Mm. Is it's it's sort of. Uh, it's maybe the economic possibilities there are a bit, a bit lower, a bit lower. Mm-hmm. Uh, the distances are a little bit uh, uh, longer also. Uh, and mm-hmm. uh, we, we see now that they are like uh, getting out of the train at the moment. Those have been like some, some Eastern Finland Mm-hmm. Clubs have been like the first ones who really have done like a good job like 15 years ago or something like that. But now they are not able to compete because not so many people are living there. Uh, uh. They have to travel a lot. They, they uh, don't get the same chances. So, so we are missing that. And we are now creating this that you... You really need to live in a big, big city or bigger city to get the opportunities. Migrant populations. Hmm. Yeah, that, yeah. That, that's that's really interesting. Yeah. It's. Uh, I guess. I guess when we're when we are investigating, when we're evaluating, we, we have to understand that there's, the you know, we we always have these intended benefits um, and maybe neglect some of the costs associated with it and for a really balanced perspective just trying to be and and, and, really and Britain, somebody's costs that. somebody's costs don't appear until far down the road mm. yeah yeah which which i mean to the to the to the human eye in in a lot of our culture where we're, we're used to things being instant um the future mm. the future is not something we really consider it's almost not real mm. um you know, like a, you take, um, I don't know how prevalent this is in floorball, but uh, at at under nine, um, there's a lot of things that we can do to, uh, you know, kind of manipulate how the players play to win, you know, to win games. And mm-hmm. and that part of that's, you know, getting the ball as close to the opponent's goal as mm-hmm. you can and, and shooting. And, you know, part of that's, you know, part of that's natural and it's a solution to a game. Which is good, but uh, you know when when the uh, when the coaches kind of start to invite this behavior of uh, kind of thoughtlessly moving the ball forward, you know over time it, it does have a delayed cost. But people are like, well, my coach is my coach is doing great. Look, we're winning. You know, we're winning mm. nine to one. What what is the problem? Mm. So yeah, we get that too. We get that too. Absolutely. Yeah. So it's. Uh, it's it's a really I think it's a really difficult thing to overcome. Mark Mark is Mark and Dennis have uh, have been you know just conversations is probably the most powerful tool that we have. Yeah, in interaction. Conversations, yes, yeah. and you know it being interactive, we can we can say that it's you know it's bi-directional learning, really. Mm. Oh. But, mm. um, I think I think evaluating with people. Maybe a cost and benefit analysis is maybe a, a, maybe it's oversimplified, but maybe it's a little bit more clear way to approach a conversation when we're talking about these, you know, elite opportunities or in the setting of the right challenge point. Sure, mm. we can create I a think, little more challenge, but it's you know, four hundred. Yeah, we can start by asking the kids as well. I mean, that's a simple one. We absolutely, don't. absolutely. Mm. Yeah, I, I think that. Uh, we we are just just thinking that when you mentioned Dennis, is you know, when when you got to look at so what is 
your, our duties as a coach, whether you're working in the Finnish Federation, the Swedish national team, or a local community in East Finland, it, it's learning. You're working with learners and you're helping them to learn. You're having to learn to play a sport and develop as people within the sport together with some friends in a community. Mm. And, and really, you can just say it's a learning environment, a learning space. And anything that distracts you from that should be just ignored, I think. If this model we're putting in is distracting us from learning, but it's got flashing lights, it sounds great, and gives us a very quick return, then it's not worth working with because it's distracting us from what we're doing. So if right. something is distracting you from learning, don't, don't do it. And the other thing as well is I had a friend who, who, who works in football and lives in a kind of a small rural community and was asking me it's similar uh, how do we get to you know we need to play a better opposition and I said you know because of your geography ge geographic constraints if the best games and the best opponents you can meet are in your own training session that's great you know make your training session make sure that your players meet their best opponents in their in your training sessions that's a good learning environment yep totally so what distracts your is what is distracting our focus and the learning in it and often for me it's a lot of these gimmicks these toys they put out in the market these gurus selling stuff um we have to do it remember i love like we have to do it like the dutch or we have to do it like the croatian we have to do it this way that way but that's just all distracting us from what we're working with and jason and and Jorg and uh, Jan and, J and Jason and Canadian FA, Jorg and Jan and Dutch FA were very clear about this as well. You know, don't copy and paste these things, but that's because that's a distraction as well. Right. And we, you know, in Canada, you know, all these fo fantastic football schools set up by top clubs, recent, you know, in the last years to, that were, you know, charging a lot of money, sucking in players from communities and killing off local clubs. Where are they now? They left the club. They left the country the minute COVID turned up. Exactly. Because it wasn't profitable anymore. That, they were just noise. That's all they were. They were noise distracting us from our duty and our work and, and what we should be really doing. And I think the, the challenge, I think particularly North America is very franchise, you know, <laughs> based system, isn't it? I think there's just a lot of noise. Um, and it's, yeah. Uh, it's it has influenced people's thinking to the point that they, now they believe it, everything is real and it becomes this huge myth as per tree you're going through. It's yeah, it's definitely there. Um, really good conversations, Mark. Um, obviously, we had a week off. Um, no wonder you've got a tan, by the way. You're sitting in the sunshine like that. I am. Yeah. <laughs> you, need, you need some shade, buddy. Um, a lot of people. I don't um, think the future's that bright. <laughs> um, <laughs> A lot of people contacting you and just having some uh, questions, particularly around the constraint-based framework. Yeah, I've been seeing a lot of stuff about constraints, let approach a lot of discussions on social media. And for some reason, people think it's a model. And it, it's not. And I think maybe in the future, we should do a podcast just kind of clarifying a few things. Uh, what what it is etc because it's been so many misinterpretations of it and because if you utilize it as a framework for understanding um human uh, the emergence of human coordination and development under constraints it's a really powerful framework to a lens to look through learning in development but the danger so, but the danger is it's becoming distracting because people don't understand it yeah, and it's, uh, it's becoming, people are saying it's a model and looking at it as a model. It's not right. a model. And, you know, and the, uh, you know, the only model for the human system is the human system itself anyway. So. <laughs> so it's like, so I think we could do something in that. And yeah, uh, maybe in a few weeks, I'll uh, maybe prepare for something and might get, might even get Rick Shuttleworth on or even Keith Davids on to just, and we can just deeper discuss because I've seen some stuff presented recently and it's you know and the thing is also it's it's kind of funny i don't mind people supporting cla as long as they know what it is and, and then it should be it should be a it should be a framework 
that's criticized, but it's actually presented as a model and criticized as a model, but then it's been criticized by people that don't understand it. Right. So yeah, I'm, I, and I'm all for discussion. I've had some really healthy discussions with some colleagues, you know, that have good worthwhile critiques, but they well, understand that it's not a model. So well, um, we can get into that some other time, you know? I was just going to ask you quickly, what, uh, what is the distinguishable difference between a framework and a model? Well, we use, we, in, in our work, Dennis and I, we, we look at the idea of a framework as something being flexible, a more flexible framework. Mm -hmm. You know, you have player development models, which is the standard model of talent development. But at AIK, we're trying to develop a player development framework that's flexible and sensitive to, 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 to individuals in social cultural contexts. So that's it. That's how we're working this distinguish your model. And, you know, as I said, I still think the, the, the only model of the human system is, is the human system itself. Mm. So that, that's, that's how we work with it. So the yeah. model, but maybe, the model think, in a sense, would be like more of a prescription, uh, prescribed approach. Yeah, but, you know, there's good models as well. I'm not saying it's bad, but it's just presenting constraints that approach as a model is, is just... And and then supporting or criticizing it maybe just means you don't understand what you're supporting or criticizing, right? You know, and that's the way I look at it. And it's 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 a pity because it's such a powerful lens. It's just another theoretical lens to look through 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 what we work within. And it's you know I find it very powerful and useful. Some people might, but that's that's fine. But um, I don't know, Perte, what do you think? Any input you're, the, you're the researcher, but yeah, I've been using this. Uh, I, I thought that maybe the way I use it is like a, it's one tool for me to use mm -hmm. during uh, with my team. I, I can use it. Uh, and I always say to the coaches that I uh, like try to explain this that they they sort of try to think it through themselves that. If, mm. if I do this, and I will get this result. But I, I try to explain that it's not. That's like the wrong way to do that. You create some. You create some. Con mm. Let's say you create some constraints and see what happens, mm. and how yeah, players yeah. react, and, and then uh, then you get an idea. But you you can't like uh, draw a map from it. No. Yeah. yeah. So I think I've it's. Been, yeah. Yeah. Go ahead. Oh, no, but I, I think I, it's something you could look through the lens of your floorball uh, association's work at the moment. And I must say it's really impressive to hear that you're actually investigating mm -hmm. uh, yourselves by asking questions. That's very, very impressive. Mm. You know? Yeah, that is good stuff. Mm. Sorry, Britain. Oh, no, I was just going to say, you know, um, the, way the, the way that I've been you know, kind of looking at the this constraints led approach with uh, you know with our teams and that sort of thing is that we're we're hoping to make impressions on you know personal constraints you know for mm. players uh, using task mm. and, and environmental constraints and uh, you know kind of identifying what are what are the environmental constraints that exist in the game um, mm. and I, I think some people are thinking oh uh, you know I use constraints like one touch you know to you know to get a certain behavior and I, okay that that does affect some change but uh are they constraints that exist within the game and does that help mm. you know players affect you know some of their own personal constraints but uh mm. but uh yeah i, I would like a, a deeper understanding um and I think, yeah oh, i think i think we will organize one one around that that'd be really yeah. nice i think yeah. I think my, my presentation will not be uh, me as an expert <laughs> in constraints that approach, but uh, my, my path uh, in exploring it as, yeah. a, as a practitioner, as a coach. Mm. Mm. Very good, James. Really, yeah. um, anything else that you would like to chat about before we wrap this up? And Mark, I can hear you watching football over there. You may want to jump on the field and lace your boots up. Can you see it? I can. There you are. What a sight that is. I miss that. <laughs> no, I think really good stuff. Uh, and, and Petru, your, uh, your, your ideas and your questions bring up 
um, one idea for me is this, uh, this concept of via negativa, right? What Mark mentioned about, you know, anything that distracts us from our goals, get rid of it, mm. right? Any, all of these inefficiencies and everything, uh, get rid of it, run a, a mm. little bit. Dampen. I think we could all stand to run a little bit mm. leaner program. Yeah, probably reality. left with just a ball. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what do you, what do you amplify and what do you want to dampen? Yeah, yeah. That's really kind of what you look at. And I guess that's what the journey Perth is on at the moment with the, with the, the finished floor ball. You're mm. kind of examining what do we need to amplify and what do you need to dampen. And maybe, maybe the message you get from the kids is that this traveling is tiring. So maybe you have to dampen that. Yeah. Mm. And, you, and you have to think of new ways to get, you know, maybe you have to look at your training environment and training designs and how do we really get competitive games going in training i don't know you know this it, this could go many many different ways you're you know you, you're you're far more experts than any of us Peter, because you're in the environment working with it so mm. i'm really f- yeah. looking forward to hear hear how this all pans out and what feedback yeah. you're getting you know really yeah. i hope you come back and let us know I'd love to mm, brilliant. all right well we will see uh i'll see you two gentlemen uh next week Perth, thank you for coming and uh, i think it was thank a good you. chat that a lot of people will be able to relate to so fellas we'll see you on the other side great stuff thanks Cheers. thank you